Good evening, all. So we're about to pick up in uh, Genesis chapter 27. And this is probably a story that almost everybody is familiar with. And it's, <laughs> there's a couple things. Just let's look at uh, verses 34 and 35 of chapter 26. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Barry, the Hittite, and Basmath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. And they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. The they there probably is all three of them. <laughs> Esau and the, and the wives. And so we've got that. Now we've got a time shift, a time frame where at this point, Esau is 40 years old. It could be as much as another 40 years before chapter 27. It doesn't really give us a definition there, but somebody worked out working backwards from when how old Joseph was, when he met Pharaoh, and when uh, Jacob came into, and all this stuff. And it says later on that... Uh, um, in 3528, that Jacob died at, or Isaac died at 180 years old. And so this could have been, right now, he's 100 years old because he was 60 when Esau and Jacob were born. So he's, he's about 100 years old now, and we don't know how much time frame jumps between when Esau chose to marry these women at 40 years old and the next chapter. But it seems like it could be a fairly lengthy time frame, which means that Esau's married at 40. Jacob's going to be significantly older when he gets married. They, they even estimate that when Joseph was born, uh, Jacob was 91 when Joseph was born. So he had his... 12 children. So all that, it's difficult to always track your time frames in the scripture because they, the author is sort of grouping together information and saying, okay, and then Genesis uh, 27, now it came about when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim to see and he called his older son Esau and said to him, my son, and he said to him, here I am. And Isaac said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, please take your gear, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare a delicious meal as I love it, and bring it to me that I may eat, so that my soul may bless you before I die. So, we all know this story, don't we? Anybody here not fairly familiar with what transpires in this whole thing? I, I've got a good question. Who's the good guy in this story? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> I mean, Esau is, is in this position from something he did, very silly thing he did earlier when he was hungry. You know, he already sold his birthright. And as such, you know, this, I don't know if that information was available to Isaac or what was transpiring. Rebecca probably knew what had transpired between the boys. But we've got this situation playing out where, um, and again, we don't know whether Rebecca confided in Isaac what was said to her when the Lord spoke to her about the trouble in her womb, the struggle going on in her womb. What did he say? What was the expression? The older that? will serve the younger. Yes, the older will serve the younger. And so that foreshadowing was there. She knew it at that point. Obviously, Jacob was her favorite, and Esau was Isaac's favorite. And so we've got this particular thing playing out. And so it's, there's a number of things that transpired here that, that make it 
that have always given me trouble with this story. And so we've got it starting out where, uh, so Re Rebecca's listening. She's in the background. Isaac spoke to her son Esau. When Esau went to the field to get the game, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Behold, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, saying, Bring me some game and prepare a delicious meal for me, so that I may eat and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. So now, son, listen to me as I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice young goats from there so that I may prepare them as a delicious meal for your father, as such as he loves. Then you shall bring to your father that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. But Jacob said to his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. What's his, res what's his first reservation? I'll get caught. <laughs> I'm going to be busted, Mom. <laughs> there's, there's no way... Dad's going to not see that it's not me. Perhaps Father will touch me. Then I will be like a deceiver in his sight. Well, he <laughs> is a deceiver in his sight, but Isaac doesn't know it at that point. And I will bring upon myself a curse and not a blessing. So his primary thing is, if this doesn't work, not only don't I get a blessing, I'll get a curse out of this situation. But his mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Only, um, only obey my voice and go get the goats for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made a delicious meal such as his father loved. She obviously knew what ingredients to put in there that would make it seem like wild game tasting the way Esau would have prepared it. Because you're not going to take a domestic goat and have it taste the same as what you would a, some wild game that was in the field. She's obviously as skilled with her spices and, and whatever she's doing in order to make it, not only is she making something, going to make something such that Jacob will be able to deceive his father, the food itself is going to deceive him. He's not going to recognize, oh, this is go. Um, so she's she's a clever woman. <laughs> um, then Rebecca took the best garments of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house. Now this is the first reference to them having a house. Up till this time, every time we've had a reference to Abraham and Isaac or the the family, they've always been in tents the intense population, you know? And so at this point, they have a structure of some form that they're actually living in. And it's a number of years have passed since uh, even um, Esau's marriage when he was 40 and put them on her younger son, Jacob. So she's preparing the food. She's got the plan. She's actually placing these garments on her son, Jacob, such that and these would probably be not the garments he would normally wear out to hunt. And so the impression that, that, that you have is if the process were to play out that Esau was going to bring the food, he would go out, he would hunt, come back, he would prepare the food, he would change into suitable clothing to go into his father to receive the blessing. That clothing then would have been in the house. Mom knew where it was. She was probably had care of that that stuff, um, so that it was it was there. Um, then Rebecca took the best garments, da 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 da, and she put skins of young goats on the hands, on the smooth part of his neck, on his hands and the smooth part of his neck. How many of you have pet a goat? <laughs> Has this ever bothered you, this part of this story? I just assume so crawl like a goat. <laughs> well, well, young, young goat. Yes, young goat, but also I found out that this particular goat, in all likelihood, there's an eastern variety of goat, which is called a camel goat, which actually the Romans used in place of hair because it had a very similar feel to it. 
And so that, because I've always thought, you know, I've petted a goat. That, <laughs> no way is that going to feel like the backside of my, I've got a fairly hairy arm here. And yeah, it's not going to feel like that. But apparently that particular variety of goat could easily simulate human hair. So that, you know, that, that helps me with this story because it's always bothered me. It's like, how can, how can that work to have, you know, goat skin on the back of your hands? <laughs> Tell the story, get your goat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then he came to his father and said, my father. And he said, here am I. Who are you? My son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's like, Argh. your firstborn. I have done as you've told me. Come sit now and eat of my game so that you may bless me. Do their voices sound alike? No. We're going to see that in just a minute. Okay. That <laughs> Isaac's thinking, what's going on here? Uh, Isaac said to his son, how is it that you've done this so quickly, my son? Not only did you go out and find the game and kill the game and got it back, you prepared the food and come to me. How did that happen? And also showered and put on your best clothes. That's right. <laughs> you, you, you know, you prepared yourself for this, hop, for this blessing, which is a more formal procedure. You know, that's a big deal. And Isaac said to Jacob, to Jacob, Please come close so that I may feel you, my son, whether you're really my son Esau or not. Yeah, he's, red flags are going off. Esau's going, something's not right here. Um, lost it. 22. 22, okay. So Jacob came close to his father, Isaac, and he touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob. But the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He, we're going to have him blessing him three times here. There's this official blessing at the end of the chapter. But at, at each point, he's basically, there's, there's a, a blessing right here. So the blessing, I think, in this case is, oh, I'm relieved. My qualms are quieted, I, you know, he says the voice was, um, and he blessed him, and he said, are you really my son Esau? And he said, I am, bring it to me that I meet. So he, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. So he still had that, that reservation, but I think once he blessed him, then he sort of re resigned himself Bring it to me that I may eat my son's game, that I may bless you. And he brought it to him, and he ate. And he also blessed him, or brought him wine and drink. Then Isaac's father said to him, please come close and kiss me, my son. So he came close and kissed him. And when he smelled the smell of the garments, he blessed him and said, okay, another confirmation. This is my son Esau. See, the smell of my son is like the smell of the field which the Lord has blessed. Rebecca was a smart lady. She had everything set up there. So in verse 28, then he gives an official blessing. Now may the God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and an abundance of grain and new wine. May people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master of your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Curse to those who curse you and bless to those who bless you. That's kind of parallels some of the blessing that God had given to Abraham, doesn't it? What's missing in there? There's something significant missing. Yeah, that you're going to be the father of a bazillion people. The, the <laughs> That's kind of missing. Numerous as the dust of the earth. Okay, there's one thing. The other thing that's missing completely is the promise of the land, which was part of that blessing that came first to Abraham and then to Isaac. 
the blessing of the land as well. This land will be yours. And so this blessing that he's giving to who he thinks is Esau is missing some critical elements of the blessing that God had given to both Abraham and Isaac. It's not as comprehensive a blessing at this point. Now it came about as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had hardly gone out from the presence of his father Isaac that his brother Esau came in from hunting. He, then he also made a delicious meal. So he got back, but he hadn't prepared the meal yet. So it almost sounds like one's going out of the, out of the tent and the other one's coming in. Not the case. He came back. So he came back after Isaac had blessed Jacob and Jacob had left the presence of his father. And then Esau prepares the meal, gets himself ready, cleaned out. I don't know if he went and got the clothes or not, but <laughs> they may have been back in the closet for all I know. Um, then he made a delicious meal and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled violently. Who then was he who hunted game and brought it to me so that I ate from all of it before you came and blessed him? Yes, he shall be blessed. Yes, and he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out an exceedingly great bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me as well, my father. And he said, and he said, this would be Isaac saying to Esau, your brother came deceitfully and has taken away your blessing. Then Esau said, oh, he, oh, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has betrayed me these two times, took away my birthright. And behold, now he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? But Isaac replied to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master, and I have given to him all his relatives as servants, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me as well, my father. So Esau raised his voice and wept. This one also seemed kind of weird. Yeah. I have two questions. Yeah. What did it benefit Rebecca to do that? I mean, if she was going to do it because she was in with Jacob, he still didn't get to hang out and spread the wealth with her. No, no. He, he was, had to leave. He had to leave a short time. So after. that it kind of backfired. What was the benefit of her even doing that between the two sons besides favoritism? And Two, Esau already knew he lost the birthright. That was the blessing of all the firsts of all, or the wealth. The inheritance, the, yeah. I mean, Jacob could have rescinded, Isaac could have rescinded it, but he, he, there wasn't yeah. nothing left anyway. Oh, man. I, again, it's, 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 Jacob, it's uh, mostly speculation. We know that Jacob was her favorite, and we know that she had a revelation from God that she may have shared with Isaac, but Isaac stubbornly was refusing to acknowledge the fact that Jacob was to be the heir. I want Esau. I want Esau. And so you don't know what transpired between the two of them. And those are possibilities, is that I'm, I'm fairly confident that she would have shared with Isaac what God had said to her at, about what was happening with the with the infants as they were born. I think you still have to remember that God's plan is not going to be for it. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. uses different people for different purposes. Yeah. And, 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 and Esau was punished for giving up his birthright. Yeah. And all, all the deceit and everything like that, it's like out of these flawed people, <laughs> God is going, his purpose is going to be realized. It's going to be realized in spite of who he has to work So Isaac could have stayed on giving everything back to you. Yeah. The other thing that, that, that has 
you know, it took me a while to, to come around to understand is, is what the deal was with the blessing. Why couldn't he just rescind the blessing and say, I was deceived and all this stuff. And I was reminded of the situation where Daniel is in, is in the court and this edict goes out where I've made an edict and once it's stated, it cannot be amended. It is done. And so he, you know, in order to save people, another edict had to be made, but he couldn't rescind what was already done. And I have a sense that the blessing was probably treated in a similar fashion. Is Once that's done, that's locked in stone, and that cannot be undone. And so, you know, that's something that might be foreign to us. You know, we amend the laws up. You know, we can legalize marijuana for all we want. You know, it's like all the time things are being modified. But in certain cultures, once something's done, it's locked. It's locked in stone and it's not going to be undone. And so that, that you know, to me is the simplest explanation for why it wasn't amended. It's like he's not the firstborn. And this may be the first time that Esau acknowledges to his father that he sold his birthright. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that concept of once it's it's done, it's done, even further magnifies the significance of grace that comes with Jesus. Because once something is done that we do, it's not like, oh, you just need your bed, like that's it, you're you're gonna go to hell. It's like we continuously have this grace and forgiveness that is just beyond understanding. Thank you. So that, that's a really cool concept to yes. realize. Yeah. So anyway, the, then the father, Isaac, answered him and said, Behold, this is what he says to, to Esau at this point. What do I have left for you? Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling. Oops. And away from the dew of the heaven above. And by your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But it shall come about, when you become restless, that you will break the yoke from your neck. So he's recognizing the consequence of what's transpired. You're no longer foremost in the household. You're going to be serving your brother, and there's going to be a yoke about your neck. That blessing that came... He's falling on your brother. And, uh, but, you know, so Esau held a gut. <laughs> I think this makes sense. Held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to him, to himself, the days of mourning my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, when the words of the elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, he was probably ranting <laughs> around the camp or whatever, um, was reported to Rebekah. She sent word and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Now then, my son, obey my voice and arise and flee to Haran to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Just a few days. Until your brother's anger against you subsides and he forgets what you did to him. <laughs> How likely is it? Then I will send word and get you from there. Why should I lose you both in one day? So the anticipation is that Isaac's going to die and Esau's going to carry out his threat. And she's thinking that's imminent. It's speculated that it was 43 years later before Isaac finally died. <laughs> but she's thinking all this is transpiring and it could be tomorrow that I lose my husband and my first and my second born, my favorite, my, my Jacob. And so, um, so now Rebecca says to, to, to Isaac, she's told her son he needs to flee. But she goes to Isaac and said, I am tired of living with these daughters of Heth. 
If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth like these, from the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Um, now, before we go on to 28, so we had Isaac actually, and I'm sure this story was related to the children, how Rebecca came to be in that location with them. The whole story about the servant and the camels and her coming out to the well and all the fulfillment that God had, all the, all the confirmation that God had said, this is the right woman, this is the one, that that story had been told in the household. And each of those kids knew what the story was. But Esau, at 40 years old, decides, I'm just going to marry these women because they're nice looking and they're local. They're here now. And so he basically didn't have any consideration. Jacob, however, did not marry. He did not even, as far as we know, seek a wife. So now we've got at the start of chapter 28, Isaac calls Jacob the mother's already told Jacob to go to Haran, but Isaac calls Jacob, blesses him, blessed him, and commanded him, saying to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And this particular future engagement is going to vary significantly from what happened with Isaac, but we'll get into that in a minute. Arise and go to Padam around to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and from there take yourself a wife from the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God, now listen to this blessing, may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you so that you become a multitude of people, that he may he also the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you so that you may possess the land and where you live as a stranger, which God has given to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Pedem Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. So this blessing, the blessing that he gave to Esau didn't include the land or the multitudes. But now, as he's blessing him to, to, to leave, he includes those two as part of the blessing that he gives for his departure, and it references the blessing to Abraham in the process. So Isaac, you know, I'm thinking, Isaac may have had this sense that Esau's not the right one to bless anyway, because he thought he was blessing Esau when he did that first blessing. And he didn't include the Abrahamic reference. He did not include the land. And he did not include the multiple, multiples of peoples. And so he may have, in his, in his even unconscious mind, recognized Esau is not the one to get the Abrahamic blessing. And here he's doing a much more thorough reference to that. So he saw him again after he deceived him. To yes. Tell him to go find a wife. He didn't say anything like, "What the heck were you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> What's done is done. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> Unfortunately, and we don't know the time frame um, of from when the blessing happened and when the departure happened because Esau's threat was on the death of Isaac. Yeah. I'm going to kill my brother Jacob, and so there could have been. He obviously didn't die right away. And so there could have been a, a more significant time frame than the next day, Rebecca says go. And, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of talk in the camp about it, but it, it could have been some additional time frame. Well, if they were in the house and Esau was already married. Yeah. Right? Might <laughs> not have been living, own house, so they had... living in the same location. Yeah. So now we've got. Well, um, culturally, do we know if. Um, there may have been a blessing intended to come to Jacob anyway that just didn't get around to it in the first time? I, I don't even know. That's a good question. 
You know what I almost always do when people ask me really good questions I don't know? I, don't I give them homework. <laughs> <laughs> I give them homework. <laughs> I can't answer that, so well, I mean, maybe the, you the can. Second, the second part of the blessing, perhaps that's what he had intended to give to him in the first place, because maybe he's temperamentally better suited oh, yeah, for, for think, these things yeah, than think, Esau was. And, Maybe that was how he was intending to divide it probably, in the first place, but it never got around to it. I think it probably everybody recognized that Jacob would have been the better head of household and leader of the, the clan. Um, he's going to be absent many years now, but Isaac still remains alive during his absence because he didn't die until he was 180. And so, and the two brothers actually get together to bury him. And that's after their whole thing. So let's read uh, 6 through uh, 9 here. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Pedamaram to take himself a wife from there. And that when he blessed him, he commanded him saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and his mother and gone to Pedamaram. So Esau saw the daughters of Canaan, displeased his father Isaac, finally got the message <laughs> that his current wives were not pleasing to his parents. Esau went to Ishmael and married, besides the wives that he had, Mahatholeth, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebaroth. So, he's saying, well, perhaps I can please my parents by getting a bride who's not a Canaanite woman, but what's her lineage? She's Egyptian. She's the, all right, the, the son of an Egyptian maidservant and Abraham, and he's married an Egyptian wife. And those, so those offspring, so again, it's not the home turf. That's right. I read that and thought he was being mean and was rebelling. So, yeah. If you don't like that one, I'll we're try it. this one. Yeah. How about Ishmael's like offspring? I know. And again, that's I have don't know what his motivation was. It could be to try to appease his parents, but it also <laughs> could be. I, you know, that, that has even occurred to me. Oh, that was my first thought. I'm so like, they go, I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, I'll get What's Ishmael's daughter. And then, because, mm. you know, Ishmael was basically living off, and his whole prediction for his life was to be so a, was an, an, an adversarial <laughs> relationship with everyone around him. And so I'll get the daughter of, of Ishmael. Oh, actually. Oh, it's like, all right. <laughs> so, and and again, it's... It is so strange to try to figure out, well, who's the good guys in this in this story? Um, and then we have him going to, to live with Laban and, and, and that whole exchange and how Laban treats Jacob. It's like, okay, all these people. Um, the children are real deceiver, huh? Yeah. So anyway, let's just start in, in uh, verse 10 here. We've got about 10 minutes. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Now, Haran is a long way. Beersheba's down here, and here's the Dead Sea. Here's about where Jerusalem would be. And then Haran is off the map up here, 600 miles plus. And so it's a major trip. Now, he is going off to find his bride. What does it say about his accompaniment, his provisions? Nothing. He's sleeping on a rock out in the wilderness. Don't know how much provisions Isaac had, had provided for him. It doesn't sound like he's accompanied by a whole force of people and attendants and servants and, and all of that. The impression that you get just from reading the, the Ross text here is he's on his own going through this wilderness, traveling up 600 miles, and he um, 
And he happened upon a particular place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and made a support for his head and he laid down next to it in place. Now, if he had servants in attendance, they would have prepared a place for him to lay, I would think. And so he's likely out there pretty much, you know, on his own. And he had a dream and behold, a ladder was set up from the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Then, behold, the Lord was standing above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Okay, here comes the promises. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will be spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So this is a reiteration of the, both the blessings that we saw before with Abraham and Isaac, that God himself is now, not only did he get the blessing from his father, he's getting it directly from God in this vision, this dream. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, The Lord is certainly in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So Jacob got up early in the morning and took that stone that he had placed as a support for his head, set it up as a memorial stone, poured oil on its top, and he named the place Bethel, but had previously been the city, the name of the city had been Luz. And Jacob also made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take, I give him and give me food to eat and garments to wear. Doesn't sound like he's got any attendance with him here. God will give me provisions here, and I return to my father's house in safety. Then the Lord will be my God, and this stone which I have set up as a memorial stone will be God's house, and everything that you give me, I will assuredly give a tenth to you. So he makes his commitment to God there in this location, this particular place that he's named Bethel, again, if you're thinking right here is the Dead Sea, west of the Dead Sea, about even with the top is Jerusalem. Um, Bethlehem is slightly below that. Bethel would be just about the same distance above. So he's traveled about 70 miles from Beersheba to get to that location, maybe his third night out on the road something like that, where he's been traveling, not main roads, byways, uh, and then found himself outside the city of Luz. And then this circumstance plays out. From there, he has still to go <laughs> 500 and some miles to get up to Haran and finish his journey. But he has this promise and this assurance from God. So if you try to think in terms of what has transpired for him in this last time frame of he's been encouraged by his mother to deceive his father. He's got his brother threatening to kill him. He's fleeing that area under the pretense of uh, you've got to go get a bride from this area, but you also have to get out of here because your life is in danger. <laughs> and so... He's finding himself, you know, probably exhausted after a long day. He has this vision, and God is basically saying, you're going to be okay. I'm going to be with you, and you're going to be blessed, and this land is going to be yours, you know, and that whole blessing, and I'm sure he'd heard that blessing that was given to Abraham and the blessing that was given to Isaac. He's heard that again and again and again, and now God is just delivering it right to him and saying, it is you that will that share in this blessing. 
that this promise that I made to Abraham. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah. This vow he made, does it bother anybody else than me? I'm like, okay, God, if you be with me, keep me safe and give me food and give me clothes so that I can come back to my father's house in peace, then you will be the Lord my God. I'm like, oh, I don't know. That sounds really, it has always bothered me. It sounds so presumptuous. And it sounds so opposite of how I understand that maybe we ought to approach God. <laughs> but they all seem to be like that. Even when they were asking the judges, asking for signs, if you give me a sign, I'll do this. If you do this, I'll do that. Uh -huh. They were just always daring him, and I didn't get that. Yeah. Because they saw the result instantly. I shall strike you down. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is that it was a dream. And even though he's, that's all played out, and he has memory of what took place in that dream, it was a dream. And so this is maybe a, when I have confirmation that what I have seen is real. There's question of what he actually Yeah, dreamed. that yeah. makes sense. If, when I have some confirmation that, that what I've seen is actually real, then I will know that you are God, that you are with me, that you have blessed me, that, and at that point, then, you've got it all. I will give myself totally to you. There may be something in it to tell us what kind of relationship that they had with God. You know, I, I've always been amazed with Abraham bargaining over Sodom and Gomorrah, <laughs> and the way Job would talk with God, and the way Moses said, look, just, you know, just kill me. If that's what you're going to do anyways, why don't you... I mean, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's disrespectful. But they had a more intimate understanding or relationship or something with God. I mean, I don't want to say we put them up on a pedestal and we're just afraid of them and begging them for things, but I'm trying to get across the idea maybe they just had a little more intimacy with God than, than we do sometimes. Even if it seems disrespectful, God likes it to me. God definitely seems to like it genuine, sincere, and just raw, real. The other side of that whole thing is, if you think in terms of covenants, is God has made his portion of the covenant, and if you fulfill your portion of the covenant, then I will fulfill this portion of the covenant as well. You know, that this declaration is, if you do that, I'll do this. You know, that, that's another possibility. I think we're done. Thank you all. We'll pick up in chapter 29, which is probably familiar as well. <laughs> The white thing got changed. Your wife's stuff. My wife's stuff. This is not what you signed up for. It's always the women. I haven't changed it because I put it in there. He started with bells and there. It's like a schnoll. Yeah. 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 Those 